First Thessalonians chapter 3 is where we'll be at tonight, and uh, we're going to be walking through a couple of these chapters, and um, this is something I've been studying, been studying through First and Second Thessalonians in my own personal Bible reading, and when Pastor asked me to preach, the Lord brought it to mind, and I was praying about it, and I believe this is the message that the Lord has for us in this hour, and why am I the one delivering it, and why this, I'm not sure, but the Lord knows, and so I trust that it's what we need to hear and so I ask that the Lord would speak to our hearts tonight, and may the Lord help us. We've got your Bible saying in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. The Word of God says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And since Timotheus, our brother, a minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now, we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. And I want you to pay attention to that last verse there, verse number 8. For now, we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. I'd like to bring a message entitled, We Live If Ye Stand. We Live If Ye Stand. Let's ask the Lord for His help tonight. Oh, Father, we thank You for Your Word. Thank You that it's powerful and it changes our lives. Oh, Lord, my faith tonight is not in something that I have prepared, but it's in You. And it's in Your Word. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to people's hearts, Lord, every person's heart. And Lord, I believe that you're able. And so, Father, we just want to pause now, and we want to thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that you're alive right now. <laughs> because if you weren't alive, Lord, then we would not be here. Oh, Lord, we have no hope. I'm thankful, Lord, that you're a God of second chances. And Lord, I just pray that you would be merciful to us tonight. And we don't deserve to hear your voice, but Lord, we need to hear it. And so I pray you would speak. Lord, remove me out of the equation. <laughs> I die, I get out of the way, Lord. And I just pray that you'd use this vessel, Lord, for your glory. Speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I wonder tonight, how many of you have ever had a project that you've begun, you know, uh, work with, and uh, maybe it was something you started on, you know, you're like, ah, you know, maybe it was during quarantine time, you said, oh yeah, I'm going to clean the garage, or I'm going to, I'm really going to organize my filing cabinet, or I'm going to do something like that. <laughs> I see some laughs and <laughs> head nods around. And maybe it was a school project, and you started working on something, and you maybe didn't quite get the whole thing finished, or you're rushing the night before <clears throat> to get it finished. Uh, I won't name names, but uh, we're all guilty of that, right? But we've all had some kind of project that we've started, and we've been concerned about. We've been concerned about um, if we're going to be able to finish it or not. And tonight, as we jump into the scripture, we see that the Apostle Paul had a number of different projects, and, and they were churches, they were people uh, that he would pray for, and, and, and churches that uh, had been established by the Lord on his missionary journeys. And the church of Thessalonica was a very interesting um, story, how it got started. We'll look at that later on in the message in Acts 17. But his concern was that the, this project, this, this, this group of people that had been established, had been established in the midst of some trouble. And he was worried that because of this trouble, because of their affliction, that their faith was going to fail. Um, in fact, look at, again in verse number, um, verse number 4. He says, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, as you know, for this cause... When I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He's saying, I couldn't hold back anymore. I, I had to go send someone to make sure you guys were okay, to make sure that everything was okay. And wonderfully, Timothy came back, and he brings back some wonderful news in verse 6 
that they were doing well, that they, they were staying strong in their faith and staying strong in love and through charity, remembering things. And something amazing happened, verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all of our affliction and distress by your faith. Think of this. Don't, don't miss this. The Apostle Paul, probably what we would classify as the greatest Christian of the whole Bible, right? The greatest Christian in the New Testament, the missionary, the, the pioneer, the one who got it done, the one who, you know, hold nothing back. He was discouraged, the affliction and the distress. Yet because of this church's faithfulness, oh, he said, I've been comforted by your faith. And in verse number 8, he says, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And he was, he was reminding the church, he was saying, hey, because you're doing what's right, I have hope to keep going. Because you're standing for God, I'm, I'm living on. My, my, I'm, I'm going to keep going for Christ. Oh, and tonight I want to encourage you. All of us have people who are counting on us. We have people who are depending on whether or not we're going to stand for Jesus Christ. Look around this room. People are here tonight that need you. You might say, well, no one notices whether or not I'm here. Yes, they do. They notice. Pastor notices. Other people notice. They're, they're encouraged or discouraged by your presence or lack thereof. Don't say, well, nobody cares. Nobody talks to me anyway. Oh, that's not true. Oh, we live if you stand fast in the Lord. We live if you stand fast. All of us have something that is God-given. It's called influence. It's influence. And we can use it for the Lord, or we cannot. The truth of the matter is, all of us have a certain degree of influence, but it's up to us how we're going to steward it for Christ. Praise the Lord, the church of Thessalonica was an encouragement to the Apostle Paul, but I wonder how Gospel Light Baptist Church would hold up tonight. Would we be an encouragement to our missionaries overseas? We just heard about, you know, praise the Lord, Miss Dilfer and her testimony about how she was encouraged. But what about our other missionaries overseas? Would they be encouraged by our faithfulness? Would they come back and see what's going on in America? <laughs> yeah, that was one thing when I was studying for this message. I was just thinking, man, I wonder how discouraged some of our missionaries were when they came back and they saw the state of America. America, you know? And it's easy to point fingers and the blame, but really we know we're the ones to blame. We are the ones to blame. Why? Because we have not stood fast in the Lord. The only, this, we're going to begin and end the same way. We're going to make a full circle tonight with the Lord's help. But there's only one way you can stay faithful. We're going to look at some different specific things in the scripture here, but there's only one reason. And it's mentioned twice in, between 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. Once in the first epistle, once in the second. And if you've got your Bible open there, just turn a page or two to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and look at verse number 24. How was the church of Thessalonica able to stay faithful? How are they able to stand fast in the Lord? Look at verse number 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. You and I have no faithfulness in of ourselves. We are fickle. We, we, <laughs> we're not dependable. Okay? But the Lord is. Turn over just a couple more pages to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. Same thought. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And I want to encourage you tonight that God is faithful. Our God is a faithful God. And it is by His grace, by His faithfulness, we can stand strong for the Lord. But I want to encourage you, there are people who are hanging in the balance tonight. Some of them are in this very auditorium. And whether or not you will stand for Christ, to determine whether or not they will continue to live on. And I want to challenge you, not only in the sense of the application directly with our own brethren and sisters in the Lord. But how much even more so does it apply to the lost? Think of that. He says, now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. You know, a dead person can't live. Can't do it. They need a resurrection. And if people aren't standing fast in giving the gospel, and being a witness, then there's going to be a multitude that will never live because of our unfaithfulness. The Lord convicted me this morning when Pastor was preaching about the state of our country. And I, remember, and I began to think, what's the problem? What's, what's the answer? And the Lord said, I've given you the answer. We have the gospel. You know, the problem of America is sin. That's the problem. You know what fixes sin? Jesus. 
the gospel. You know what's funny? That command is still pertinent to us right now. It's still applicable. And what's going to happen when we get to heaven? And the Lord said, I gave you time. I gave your country space. But you would not. You would not obey. I believe there's still hope. I believe the Lord still can save anybody. Amen? Praise His name. But may the Lord find us faithful. May we stand fast for Him. It's only by His faithfulness. You know, we don't stand in our own strength. We stand in the strength of the Lord. Ephesians 6.10 reminds us tonight, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And tonight we're going to look at three things specifically as we kind of walk through these first couple chapters of the um, Church of Thessalonica, how they were faithful in these different areas, and maybe a challenge and encouragement to us to be faithful to the Lord. Number one, they were faithful in their example. They were faithful in their example. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 now, if you would. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The, the Apostle Paul is writing here, uh, writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he begins, Paul and Silvanus, or Silas, and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Now notice, as you read through this scripture, you can tell Paul's heart for this church. You can see his spiritual maturity as he has such a heart for other people. As he has such a heart for others. And he's saying, we give thanks always for you all. And you hear the gratitude. It's like making mention of you in our prayers. And look at verse 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The sight of God and of our Father. And I'll skip down to verse number 7. He said, or excuse me, verse number 6, and it says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. It's interesting here, he calls them examples. It's, it's like our word examples, it's a little bit different. You notice it's not examples, it's ensamples. So what's the difference there? There's a little bit of a difference. This specific word has the idea of a type, or something that is used to stamp an image on something else. It's to make an impression, to a lasting impression. And what Paul was calling this church is that, hey, you all are the ensample. You're the, you're the one that's leaving the impression of how it should be done. And I wonder tonight, if God looks down from heaven, he could say about your life. Yes, look at this brother, look at this sister. They're an example of the believers. Could they say that of you tonight? Are you being faithful in your example? Three things specifically, or two things specifically under this. They were examples in their service to Christ. Look again at verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. They, didn't just, they weren't just busy bodies. They, they were in the work of God. They served God, but it was faith work. Faith works, like we heard this morning in our Sunday school lesson, that it's, when we walk by faith, it, it, there's shoe leather there. There's, there's action, you know. Enoch preached, he prophesied to his generation. He didn't just sit back and watch the, the whole world go to hell. No, he preached. And God wants us to be involved in a work of faith. And let me ask you this, this evening, are you staying faithful in the work of faith that God's given you? It's easy when you say, well, Brother Chase, you know, COVID-19, yep, that's the same excuse I give sometimes, you know? It, it, it's easy to come up with excuses, isn't it? Oh, but we have no excuse when we think about our Lord. As a work of faith, are you being faithful as an example in the, in the ministry, serving the Lord? Hey, the Lord deserves our service. He deserves everything. He gave everything for us. He, it was a work of faith. And then not only that, but also a labor of love. This service to the Lord drew out of their worship. Think of that. It was motivated by love. They didn't do it because they were just told to do it. They did it because they wanted to do it. Why? Because they loved the Lord. They understood how much that Jesus gave for them. And oh, they just longed to give something back to Him. Yes. Oh, is that you tonight? I remember reading about the story of Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, 1800s. And after he got saved, he, he, was, he was in his room. He explains the situation there that he was in his room. He was studying his Bible. And the, Lord just, the Lord's love just came on him so much. And he just felt so overwhelmed. He said, oh, Lord, I just, I'm going to do something for you. I want to give my life to you. And at that point, he wholly consecrated himself to God. said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Whatever it is. 
And we know, as history tells us, that that man God used to raise up an army to take China by storm with the gospel. Now think of what God could do if we'd have a labor of love. A labor of love. It grows out of our worship. It's not by constraint. It's not grudgingly. Eh, I got to be at choir practice tonight because Brother Chase. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> got to pick up my choir members. I love you all. Okay. No, we, we love the Lord. Amen. It's a labor of love. Not constraint. Amen. And then the third thing there, the patience of hope. This is so interesting to me. It's kind of an odd combination. Patience of hope. They, they were serving the Lord, but they were serving Him patiently. Why? Okay. Well, we'll cover a little bit more. We've already talked about a little bit in our text in chapter 3. But the church of Thessalonica underwent extreme persecution. There's a lot of opposition and so it would have been very easy for them to just say, nope, I can't serve the Lord because, you know, I might get my head chopped off. <laughs> you know, that, they had legitimate excuses, you know. But you know what? They had patience as they served the Lord. Why? Because they had a hope. Because they, as, as you study First and Second Thessalonians, we understand that the main theme of it is really not their faithfulness, but God's faithfulness and His soon return, His faithful return. And so they were hoping for the return of Jesus. Think of that. They give them patience to keep on. Don't give up. Stay faithful. Oh, God is coming back. Tonight could be the night. Would He find us faithful? Oh, will He find faith on the earth? 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I love that promise, don't you? <laughs> and by the way, all that you do in me, it's not going to be in vain. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Aren't you thankful? But are you being an example? If you've grown weary tonight in serving the Lord, let me encourage you. The Lord hasn't given up on you. Just because you might have taken a hiatus, if you will, or a league of absence, hey, you're not out, okay? God will still use you if you're willing. God will still use you if you're open, if you'll let Him. Maybe that's you tonight. And maybe the Lord is pricking your heart and saying, man, I need to get back in whatever. I need to get back at where I used to be because I want to serve my God. I've only got a little time left. Oh, we don't know when our last day is going to be, folks. Jesus could come back tonight. Why do we stress so much about stuff that's going to take place a week from now or two weeks from now or a month from now or a couple months from now? If we don't even know if it's going to happen. What we do know is we've got this day. And Jesus could come back. But what have I done today to serve the Lord? Oh, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. They were examples in their service to the Lord, but also they were examples in their walk with the Lord. Look at verse 6. And he became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. I love this example here. You know, the, <laughs> this is such a beautiful testimony of discipleship. You see this? Because really what discipleship is, is as we're following Jesus, we're, we're getting others to follow Jesus with us. And we're, as we're following the Lord, we're getting others to follow us following the Lord. You see that? They're, they're following, we're, we're, we're bringing others along with us. It's not all about us. There's others that need to be brought along. And, and they were saying, Paul was reminding them, he said, hey, you, you followed me, but you followed the Lord. <laughs> you were following Jesus. And you know what happened? It multiplied. Look at this. Okay, look at them. Keep reading. They were, they were examples in this. Verse 8, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. And say, as, we, as you are following us, as, you're, as I'm following Jesus, you know what? You got all the other people that were in Macedonia, Kai, and all these other places. They said, all right, we're going to follow Jesus together. Okay, we're going to follow the Lord together. And then look at verse 9. I love this. This is such a cool story. It says, for they themselves, who? All these other people. Show of us. Who's he talking about? Paul and the others that were with him. <laughs> these other people showed Paul and them what manner of entering in we had unto you. Who's that? The Thessalonians. <laughs> How, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living God. In other words, the, the church of Thessalonica was so excited about what God had done through Paul in their lives that they just couldn't help but tell everybody about it. 
And when they told everybody about it, they knew the story so well that when Paul came along and met them, they're like, oh yeah, you're the Apostle Paul. Yeah, these guys told us about how you led him to Christ and how you got stoned and all this stuff. Wow. And Paul's like, whoa, we didn't have to tell them anything because they already knew it. Why? Because that's multiplication. That's when God multiplies. You see that? And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be faithful in that example. And some of us, we've gotten out of that. Oh, we need to get back to, just like we heard about, about teaching others also. (laughs) Reaching people with the gospel and mentoring them. That's obedience. When we don't do that, we're disobeying God. It's not optional. We like to think, oh, well, that's just for the pastor and the staff. No. The Bible says in Matthew 28, Jesus said to all the disciples, if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's you tonight. (laughs) Think of that. That means you and me. Matthew 28. I'll get there eventually. Okay. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That was a command from our Savior. And it was given to not just a few or to one or to twelve. It was given to all that would know the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to challenge you tonight. How are you... In your personal soul winning and discipleship. You know what? I'm guilty tonight. I'm not what I should be. I want to be. Oh, my Lord, help me. I want to be. But it's not enough just to have a hope. <laughs> more and more the Lord's showing me that I can be very ambitious. Very, get, get my hopes up, you know. Uh, we'll go on a trip and, you know, i, I got to watch myself. I'll take, like, you know, a whole library with me. Because I think I'm going to have enough time to read all these books. You know, Missy's laughing. She's seen me walk around the church like this with all this stuff. Why? Because I I get ambitious. I think I'm going to do all these things. You know, serving God is not just wishful thinking. There's got to be a time where we've got to be serious about it. When are you going to be serious? No better day than today. The Lord gives you the opportunity. Just pray, Lord, would you give me someone I can lead to you? Would you give me someone I can tell about what God did in my life? Oh, it'll do so much for you. Just like we heard testimony earlier, when you obey the Lord in this area, it helps you to grow. Because you know what? We'll never fully be able to grow to what God wants us to be unless we're obeying the Lord. There are certain things that we will not grow in unless we're first obeying in other areas. There are certain things that won't make sense in God's Word unless you're doing what God says. And so you've got to obey. We've got to follow the Lord. And I'm so thankful that the church of Thessalonica, they followed the Lord. What an, an amazing example. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Not only they were faithful in their example, but they were faithful to receive the Word of God. Look at chapter 2, if you would. Chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians. Paul is, is speaking some more about their investment and how God used them. And he talks about the suffering that they went through, and yet they still gave them the gospel, and they, they nourished them as a, as, a, as a nurse cherisheth her children, verse 7, they were gentle. They, they gave them not just the gospel of God, but their own souls, verse number 8. And there's so much we could bring out of here. We're just kind of getting some highlights tonight. And I would encourage you to study God's Word on your own and uh, to spend some time in God's Word this week and reading over these things and meditating on them. But look at verse number 13. He comes down and he's talking about all these things, but then he commends them for something else that I believe is the key to their faithfulness and their standing strong. Verse 13, chapter 2, For this cause also thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He's saying, I'm so thankful that when we came, you didn't esteem our words just like the words of every other religious person out there. You took the words of God and believed them to be God's words. Oh, tonight, that'll help us to stand fast in the Lord. That'll help us to be strong in God, is if we receive God's word as God's word. Hold your finger there. Turn over to Acts chapter 17, if you would. Acts chapter 17. We're coming right back to 1 Thessalonians. But this is the passage that it talks a little bit about um, Thessalonica. Acts chapter 17, and Paul going there. We won't read all of this, but we'll read a couple of the verses here. In verse number 1 of Acts 17, he says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, 
they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, that's important. Okay, Paul's manner was always to go to, yeah, verse 2, and Paul, as his manner was, okay, just read the scripture, Chase, went in unto them, all right, <laughs> just read the Bible, it explains itself, amen, yep, thank you, and three days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What was he doing? Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul. That means that they associated or united with him and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a, mul- a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. But notice verse 5, but the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy. We won't go on to read, but they take Jason and, and there's a lot of trouble in the city. And they, they say that these are the ones that have turned the world upside down. And there's all this trouble. And skip down to verse number 10. And the brethren immediately... Who's the brethren talking about? It's talking about the church. The brethren, the church. Okay? Immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into what? The synagogue of the Jews. Okay? Paul's going to do what he normally does. He's going to go to the Jews and try to witness them, right? Verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Notice verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed. Interesting, isn't it? So, Paul preached at Thessalonica, and there were were many that believed. And then the Jews, most of the Jews actually found out that that they were preaching God's word, and so they got angry and chased Paul out of town. And the brethren, they snuck him out to Berea. And so Paul does the same thing. He goes to the the synagogue, begins preaching to the Jews. He's starting first with the Jews in his ministry here. And they, in Berea, many of them believed. Why? Because they received the word with all readiness of mind. And searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now notice, it didn't say that there weren't many that believed in Thessalonica. Did you catch that? Verse 4, it says, And some of them believed. Who is the some? He's talking about the Jews there. Only some of the Jews believed. But then he says, uh, the devout Greeks, a great multitude. So it wasn't that there there wasn't a lot of belief. There was a lot of people, but only a few of the Jews. Why? Because the next part in Berea shows us that they received the word of God. They received the word of God. These some in Thessalonica received God's word for what it was. They received it for what it was. And I want to challenge you tonight. Do you receive God's word as it is? As it is. I've heard faith described as this. We often use the definition looking into Jesus. That's my favorite definition. But I've also heard this definition. I like it here. It says, taking God at his word. <laughs> taking God at his word. You know, if you take someone at your, at your word, that means that what? They're going to do what they say, right? Yeah, they're going to do what they say. Well, then why don't we believe God's word like that? Why don't we take God at his word? You know, I have a... Um, a little book with me tonight, okay? And this is Hudson Taylor. Okay, I like Hudson Taylor, in case you haven't found out. But this is an autobiography of the life of Hudson Taylor. Okay, so he, he wrote everything that's in this book. And he tells about his life and how God used him there in the ministry of China and how God brought it about and different things. It's a great book. I would encourage you to read it if you get the chance. Um, but it's the words of Hudson Taylor about Hudson Taylor and how God used him. Okay? So, but Hudson Taylor is no longer living. He's dead. All right, sorry to burst your all's bubble. Some of you might have thought he was still alive. His picture's on the hallway. But no, he, he's, he's not with us anymore. It, these were the words that Hudson Taylor said, okay? He said this at one point. I want to challenge you tonight. God's word, the Bible, is not just the words that God said, but rather the words that God is saying. It's the words that he's speaking. Our Lord is not in the grave. But yet, why do we treat it as if our Bible is dead? Why is it if it's a dead book and we come in when we know the stories and we forget that when we read these words, God is speaking? Think of that. Oh, may the Lord help us to receive it for what it is. What is it? The Word of God. The Word of God. Oh, and I believe without a shadow of a doubt that because this church received God's word as God's word, that they were able to stand fast for the Lord. You know, you cannot live for God without the word of God. You can't. 
we won't know what to do. We can't just say, I'm going to live for God and then do whatever we please. We find that all across the world. What happens? All these different religions pop up and all these different ideas pop up and everything else because everyone does what's right in their own eyes. We need a guiding line. You know what that is? It's God's word. (laughs) I want to challenge you tonight. Maybe some of you have lost faith in the God of this book. You've lost faith that this book really is the words of God. God is speaking through it. I want to challenge you tonight. The Lord wants to use his word to speak to you. But you've got to get in it. You've got to open your heart. (laughs) And instead of just busily, hastily rushing past it, just stop (laughs) and let it work in you. Just like the choir sang this morning, God's word changes lives. I believe that, don't you? We know the scripture there in... um, in uh, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful <laughs> and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing center of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know what that means? It means God's word's alive, and it works. That's why whenever we speak to people about Christ, we need to quote scripture. We need to give them uh, the word of God, because <laughs> it's God's word that will work in their heart. It's God's word that will pierce their heart. I was just reading last night a little uh, book by Oswald J. Smith, and he was talking about some revivals in the past. And he said that when, when, when a man was preaching, I think it was the Welsh revival, that there were people that they would cry out and say, Oh, God's sword has cut me. <laughs> think of that. God's sword has cut me. Oh, what about you tonight? Is God's sword cutting you? It goes back to faith, doesn't it? See, this is faith. They believed that it was God's word. Do you believe that tonight? May the Lord help us. Oh, I believe that they were faithful because of this. You know, it's sad how, how much people will give their life to anything but God's word. You know, in our FBI thing last night, Brother Bates, he was talking about how that, you know, uh, the Jewish culture there, these, these children, these Hebrew children, um, at the time when they were in, in um, the land that they were there in the, in the Middle East, that the, the language was different because it was a Greek and stuff, because the Roman Empire. Anyway, they said that they, when they, by age 12, they had the whole, I think it was, was it the whole Old Testament? It was just a whole Torah there. I think it was a whole Torah. Yeah, the first five books of the Bible memorized in Hebrew. Hmm. Wow. Think of that. When we went to England, the Lord blessed me with the opportunity to be able to go to um, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon. Shakespeare. Any Shakespeare's fans? And some people are just all about Shakespeare, you know, and stuff. And, I, and we went there, and I remember we, we met these two folks that were there, and they were actors. They, they had given their life for Shakespeare. And there was this lady there, and I'll never forget, she said that she loved Shakespeare's plays so much that she just wanted, it was so beautiful, it's like poetry, she just wanted to give her life to that. And so what she did was she volunteered there, and what she did was that you could ask her to do any part of any of Shakespeare's plays, and she would do a, a reenactment of it. Because she had all of Shakespeare's plays memorized. Think of that. Think of that. You know how pathetic it is for us as God's children <laughs> who know the Lord. You know, God really convicted me of this. I'll be honest. Earlier this afternoon, I was going over these things. I'm like, man, God, I'm such a, <laughs> so dumb. You know, help me. <laughs> help me to hide your word in my heart. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to me. Oh, may the Lord help us. And the final thing, they were faithful in their example. They were faithful to receive the word of God. And this church was faithful to have faith in the midst of difficulty and trouble. Look at the chapter 3 here. We're almost through. Chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians. He says, he's again, he's talking about how they couldn't forbear. He sent Timothy to them. And then he said that no man should be moved by these afflictions. See, they were going through difficulty. They were going through trouble. As we just read about in Acts chapter 17, although Paul fled the city, the church still lived there. <laughs> so they had to deal with all the angry Jews that didn't believe. <laughs> you know, sometimes you ever had the wish, like, man, I just wish I'd get away from my problems? Yes, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, we've all been there, right? Escapism or whatever they call it. Okay. Yeah, we've all wanted to be. They couldn't. That's where their home was. And so Paul knew they were going to go through difficulty. He knew they were going to go through trouble and heartache, and he didn't want their faith to fail. Oh, so what are some things that they had that had their faith in the midst of trouble? They anticipated this, this opposition. They anticipated this trouble. Look at verse 3, that no man should move, be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily we were with you, and we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. 
even as it came to pass, and you know, Paul warned him ahead of time. He's like, hey, look, difficulty's going to happen. Trouble's going to come. Adversity is going to happen. We've heard our pastor say before, whatever God ordains, Satan opposes, right? When you decide that you're going to try to live and stand for Jesus Christ, there is going to be opposition and trouble. Let's not be fooled to think that, oh, I don't understand why all this bad stuff's going on. Why are you trying to live for Jesus? (laughs) If you're trying to live for Him, then of course there's going to be bad stuff. In fact, at the end of chapter 2, Paul says that he wanted to see the church, but he says at the end of verse 18, but Satan hindered us. There's a spiritual battle that's going on. We can't see it. But there's demons and angels, even at this moment, that are in conflict, trying to block out some of you from hearing God's words. Oh, may the Lord help us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. They anticipated opposition. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I don't like to hear that. <laughs> But the truth of the matter is, if we're going to follow Jesus, you know, the Lord, he suffered, and he died. And Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know what that means? That means that there's going to be a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble, a lot of opposition, a lot of persecution. No one likes to hear that. You know why? Because of our flesh. But when we follow Jesus, he gives us the grace to stand strong, even when there's opposition. Oh, may the Lord help us. Too many times we're, we're so concerned about trying to avoid trouble at all costs. Well, I'm not going to go through the drive-thru because it's too long. You know, I'm not going to go to the DMV because you have to stand outside for an hour before you go in to get your license. You know? right? okay? We don't like trouble. But, instead, but God doesn't want us to avoid trouble. He doesn't want us to be moved by it. Instead, he wants us to face it by faith. He wants us to face it by faith. We can't face it in our own strength, but we can face it by faith. Which brings us to the next thing. They've responded to these trouble in faith. Look at verse number 6. He says, when Timothy came back, he said, and brought us good tidings of your faith. <laughs> they had faith in the Lord. You know, all of the troubles, all of the difficulties, all of the temptations even in life ought to be nothing more than just an arrow pointing us to Jesus. All those things, 2 Corinthians, if you read it, says, For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. That takes a lot of faith. <laughs> all things. All. You mean whenever somebody yells at you and slams the door at your face when you try to give them a gospel track? Exactly. Yes. All things are for you. Why? That we would be pointed to Jesus. Our eyes would be fixed on him. You know, the Lord's not trying to get us to, to take our eyes off of Him. He's trying to get us to keep looking at Him, to keep adoring Him, worshiping Him, keep serving Him. Oh, but what's moving you tonight? Are you moved by trouble? The Apostle Paul says in Acts 20, 24, But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know, Really, when trouble comes, it reveals the object of our faith. If I get upset because something bothers me or something changes my plan, it shows me that I'm not truly having faith in Jesus. You know why? Because I'm having more faith in my comfort or my plan or my circumstances going according to what I think they should go instead of trusting that Jesus knows well and good enough what I need. That if he allows some trouble or inconvenience, I need that. We need to have faith. Oh, we need to have faith. What moves you tonight? What moves you? If you're easily swayed by all this stuff that's going on in America, maybe it shows that your faith is not in the right place. I'm not trying to to cast stones or be any of that tonight, but I'm just trying to encourage you. Look back to Jesus. You know, I was so encouraged. Jonah, he's in the belly of the whale. <laughs> he's sinned against God. He's rebelled. He's, he's gone his own way. He's run from the Lord. And he's in the belly of the whale. And he recognizes that salvation is of the Lord. And he says something that just the Lord used to jump out to me. He says, yet will I look again to thy holy temple. You know, Jonah got in his eyes off the Lord. He saw Nineveh. But he said, Lord, I'm going to look again. Some of you tonight, you've gotten your eyes off Jesus. You've gotten your eyes, like Peter, off of Christ and on the waves and the winds and everything that's around you. You need to get your eyes back on Jesus tonight. That's what faith is. 
looking to Him. They responded in faith, and the final thing, they were, or, <laughs> uh, sorry, there's so much goodness here. They responded in love, look at the next thing here, they responded in love, charity. You know, they, they, when, it's, when trouble comes, it's easy to be hateful. Think of that. It's easy to get hateful. And I don't like saying that. I don't like admitting that. But when, I, when I'm rubbed the wrong way, I, my reaction is not to say, oh, that's okay. It's like, get out of my way. <laughs> it's like, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> no, but they responded by these troubles in love. You know, the signposts of our faith is the love of God. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. But you know why it's hard to love, especially when there's trouble? It's because it requires humility. It requires humbling ourselves. It requires admitting that we're wrong, and that our way is not right, but His way is right. That's what Jesus did. Remember Philippians 2? He humbled Himself. You know, why did, why did God send Jesus to die on the cross? It wasn't to, you know, to get rid of sin. You know, easily God could have just started over. Goodbye, human race. Hello, new people. Could have been that easy. Seriously, that easy. But you know what? The Lord loved you and I so much that he sent Jesus to die for our sins. Oh, may the Lord help us to love. And this final thought, they responded by remembering one another in the midst of their troubles. Oh, this is so good. Don't miss this. The final thought here. He, he reminds them, he says, when Timothy came, they gave him good tidings of their faith, their charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always. What was he saying? He was encouraging the church there. He said, thank you for remembering us in prayer. Thank you for remembering and not forgetting about us. You know what they did? In the midst of their difficulty, instead of looking at their problems, instead of looking at their inadequacy, instead of looking at all this stuff, they got their eyes on the Lord and because of that, they got their eyes on other people. And when they began to get their eyes on other people, they saw the Apostle Paul. You know, the, apostle, they, the church wasn't the one that was really causing the ruckus. It was the Apostle Paul. And they knew that Paul was going to go and there was going to be more trouble wherever he went. They'd heard about his journeys and everything, no doubt. And so they were concerned about Paul. And so you know what they did? They remembered him. They wanted to see him. And no doubt they prayed for him. And what I want to encourage you tonight, that, I believe, more than anything else, was what encouraged the Apostle Paul to keep going. He said, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, you stand fast in the Lord. I want to encourage you tonight, there are other people in this room that are going through a lot more difficult things than you are. There are other people that are not in this room that are going through more difficult things than you are. And may the Lord help us to quit being so selfish. And I'm preaching to myself tonight. And to get our eyes on Him and His goodness and our sufficiency. And also others, in need of others. Oh, and when you stand strong in the Lord, even though it's hard, when you have faith in God and do what's right and obey Him and have faith in Him, you remember others. Oh, you know what happens? They live because <laughs> you stand strong. You remember them. You know, church, I want to encourage you. Our pastor needs our prayers. If we don't lift up his arms, who's going to? We've got to stand strong, church. Because he's going to live if we stand. But you think about this. What about, the fate of his hand? what about the fate of his family if it's in our hands and our faithfulness? We know that the Lord is in control of that. But what if... That he got discouraged because no one came to church. No one ever listened. No one ever let God do any work in their life. They all gave up. Oh, but church, if we would be faithful and stand in our place by our man and hold up his arms instead of talking behind his back and complaining, oh, may the Lord help us to lift him up. Because when we stand, he lives. You know, not just him. Think about all of our missionaries. Think about all our pastors. Think about all of our people and across the land. May the Lord help us to stand strong for Him, the Lord. And as we stand, we can encourage one another. Um, I'm going to close by sharing this. You know, I was uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a road trip. 
made a phone call, and or I, I sometimes when I when I'm driving, I make phone calls because <laughs> it's especially long drives, you know, and just trying to pass the time. And I was praying, doing different things, and the Lord brought to mind someone I needed to reach out to. There was someone who I wasn't expecting. And some of you probably know him. His name is Pastor Clarence Sexton. (laughs) And I was like, Lord, I can't call Pastor Clarence Sexton, you know. He's, you know, he's awesome. (laughs) You know, like if I call him, you know, well, I'm nobody, you know. But God pressed it more and more in my heart. And after I wrestled with God for five minutes, you know, I was like, all right, Lord, I'll call him. And so I call him and he answered. And um, I was just so nervous, you know, I'm shaking, driving like this in the road, you know. (laughs) And, uh, And I just, and I was like, you know, Pastor, I don't know why, but God just laid all my heart for me to call you and to let you know I'm praying for you. I love you and stuff. And I'll never forget, after he finished, he's like, son, I want you to remember something. We live if you stand. We live if you stand. He's like, I'm going to live if you keep standing and do what's right. And I remember thinking, it's like, wow, you know, my life impacts so much more than what I realize. And that's not to boast anyone's self up because we can't do it on our own. Remember I said we'd come back full circle. Second Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful. Cast yourself on the Lord tonight. He is faithful. There are others that need you to live for Him.